Today's World Insight. A closer look at China-U.S. trade relations half a year into the Phase 1 deal. A respected Yale economist talks about sticking points, the U.S. election, and more. Let's negotiate on a bilateral investment treaty to open up uh, markets in both countries to each other. We came very close under President Obama, of course, under President Trump. Those negotiations have been banned. And as part of a series celebrating the 75th anniversary of victory in the War of Resistance against Japan, a walk down memory lane with a doctoral student keeping alive her grandfather's heroic deeds in defending China from invaders. The Japanese came, so they were attacked on their surprise, so everyone was killed. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. We begin with a closer look at China-U.S. trade relations. Chinese Vice Premier Liu He and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer will review the six-month-old Phase 1 trade deal in a video conference on Saturday. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic and geopolitical tensions, how has the deal fared so far? On the prospects of Sino-U.S. trade, I spoke to Stephen Roche, a senior fellow at the Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. He's also an expert on China-U.S. economic ties. We touch on trade sticking points, the U.S. election, the WTO, and China's dual circulation strategy and the Chinese economy. Let's listen in. And I'm joined by Stephen Roche, who is the senior fellow with the Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs. Professor, welcome to our program. What about the role of uh, trade and economic ties between the two countries? Uh, uh, it used to be one of those pillars. Now, of course, it's been changing. I've always felt that um, economic and trade ties were the, the ballast, the, the anchor uh, in this relationship. But that is no longer uh, the case. Yes, there will be a review on August 15th of uh, phase one a trade uh, compliance. Because of the coronavirus, uh, the Chinese purchase trajectory of uh, American uh, goods is stipulated in the January 15th agreement. Uh, those purchases have fallen well short of the, the, the targeted path. But given the shock to the US, Chinese, and global economy, uh, that shortfall is clearly uh, understandable. Mm. What concerns me, though, is that politicians in the U.S. will turn this um, shortfall into a yet another uh, aspect of um, noncompliance from China uh, and uh, uh, with respect to the agreements reached with the U.S. Mm -hmm. and just intensify uh, the conflict further. What is the best way to deal with the phase one deal, even with the difficulties of COVID-19 and its impact on the economy? You know, my own view is that the, the phase one deal was not a good deal from the start. Uh, and it, it really did very little to resolve uh, the main areas of structural conflict. So I, I personally don't think that we should uh, 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 be agonizing and, and spending a whole lot of time analyzing a deal that would not have accomplished much from the start. As you know, we have a presidential, uh, presidential election coming up uh, on November the 3rd, um, uh, and it may well be that we have a, a new administration uh, coming into power uh, in the United States in early 2021. And uh, you know, if that's the case, I'm hopeful that we simply abandon uh, this uh, uh, structure that was uh, reached uh, under the Trump administration and come up with a new approach. Uh, however, if not going with this deal, it could mean in the next uh, few months a jeopardizing further of the bilateral uh, relationship between China and the United States, given the figure that you have in the White House today and also given the fact that, after all, it has been a document an agreement after long discussion finally come to certain conclusion? Uh, the United States has a, 
uh, a major shortfall of domestic savings, and so we have to run uh, current account deficit uh, and trade deficits with many countries to uh, attract the foreign capital uh, to um, uh, make up for our shortfall of savings. Yeah. Last year, we ran 100 uh, trade deficits with 102 countries. China was the biggest. But you can't fix a multilateral problem of 102 countries uh, by focusing on one uh, China. So the deal would not have worked. All it does is divert trade from China to other uh, foreign trading partners of America, most of them are higher cost producers, and that taxes American consumers. Mm -hmm. So conceptually, the deal made absolutely no sense. And I understand what you say that, you know, this is something that both sides agreed upon. That doesn't mean it's a good deal. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it should become uh, the framework uh, for engagement in the future, especially if there's a change in administrations mm -hmm. in the United States. The art of the deal has been a slogan that this uh, president in the White House in your country been uh, using as a catchphrase. So could you help us to analyze what's likely to be this art of the deal uh, using your logic uh, if you were in their shoes? The art of the deal is certainly, uh, you know, the title of a book that uh, Donald Trump wrote. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, well before he became uh, president, um, and he's tried to implement this uh, in uh, his approach to um, foreign policy and international uh, economic policy. Uh, and basically, uh, it hasn't worked. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a deal that, uh, a framework that alleges to extract concessions uh, from uh, counterparts by uh, putting enormous pressure on them, squeezing them, using uh, all types of bullying tactics to intimidate mm. uh, negotiators and then to extract uh, concessions. Um, I'm hopeful that um, we can move away from this uh, approach completely uh, and go back to um, what I would call the wisdom of the compromise rather mm -hmm. than the art of the deal. And compromises require both parties uh, to uh, find a common ground, a middle ground, and work on areas of mutual collaboration uh, rather than uh, treat each other uh, uh, through uh, intimidation uh, and uh, threats uh, and tariffs and lawsuits and sanctions. Um, this is not a way to uh, uh, reestablish uh, a meaningful relationship between uh, the world's two most powerful uh, economies going forward. The U.S. economy, the two parties uh, failed to reach a conclusion or deal regarding how much uh, support to provide at this point of COVID-19 to the general public and the small businesses. How much uh, impact do you think this will have about uh, a schedule to help with the local economy? The Republicans uh, uh, holding office right now, especially in the Senate, uh, do not want to go to the voters uh, having turned down uh, a support package that has mm. already been passed by the U.S. House of Representatives. So, again, this is a political issue, and uh, uh, it, it's not one that um, uh, I think is a sustainable position uh, for an incumbent party to take. So I, I just think it's a matter of time before they strike a, a, a compromise deal. How you look at China's approach these days, uh, particularly the so-called the dual circulation, meaning there's an internal circulation of the economy combined with an external circulation. China's initial takeoff uh, beginning in the early 1980s was very much reliant on uh, external demand driving a powerful uh, uh, export-led uh, and GDP growth, but around the middle of the 2000s, uh, 2007 to be exact, uh, right before the global financial crisis, a big debate uh, began inside of China about mm -hmm. the wisdom of excess reliance on foreign demand. And so in the ensuing 13 years, there's been a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on developing uh, internal private consumption to balance out 
what had been an unbalanced economy. And some progress is very encouraging, but there's still uh, a lot of work to go. And in terms of the, the near-term outlook for the Chinese economy right now, um, that internal demand piece, in my opinion, still remains a, a big question mark uh, as Chinese consumers, uh, like, like people all over the world who have been afflicted with this horrible coronavirus, uh, are still fearful of reinfection, so that limits uh, consumption. Meanwhile, the external piece of the Chinese economy that was so strong uh, is uh, uh, also being impacted uh, by a very sharp uh, uh, moderation of, of global trade around the world okay. as this uh, uh, recession has really left no country uh, un untouched. So it is a, still a very challenging economic climate for, uh, for China. And uh, even though uh, China was first to recover, the, uh, you know, the outlook over the next uh, couple of years, I think, remains um, you know, quite, quite cloudy. Mr. Roach, what do you make of the current realities of this international trade platform and its implications that all of the trading nations, including China and the United States, are going to feel? Well, the, wor the world needs a, a rule-based structure for trading to adjudicate um, uh, disputes and complaints and to track data. And uh, the Trump administration has made it very clear that it is uh, dead set against um, uh, the, the WTO in its current incarnation and has resisted making appointments to um, uh, the officials who adjudicate uh, disputes. Uh, and again, this is a political uh, position that taken by an administration that is against multilateralism uh, and uh, feels that uh, you know, international organizations are not in uh, the best interests of a president who is very nationalistic and focused on solely making America great again, rather than in um, uh, really providing support to global institutions that underpin an interconnected world. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, if you look at the schedule recently in Geneva, you will notice that, that uh, the U.S. side, uh, I would assume it's uh, related to this administration, have been working very hard to uh, kick China out of the, some of the multilateral trade discussions, uh, not formal ones, but rather informal ones, uh, seminars and also discussion sessions. Uh, do you think there's likely to be a danger of that in the longer term or even more severe than what it is already happening? No, again, I just I think this is uh, uh, politics that um, will hopefully um, uh, run its course uh, after the upcoming uh, November election. I think there's a broad recognition, and this goes way back to the negotiations of China's WTO accession mm. uh, uh, in the 1990s that culminated in 2001, that uh, it is in the world's best interest, uh, including the United States, including China, uh, for all of us to um, uh, join together uh, as members in a, in a framework uh, that allows us to resolve differences and um, iron out disputes. Uh, Mr. Roche, uh, you've been watching, I'm sure, the two political parties in your country. Uh, on the one hand, you have this administration certainly is not using constructive ways to come up with a stable framework for this relationship, no matter what the nature of it is. Uh, on the other hand, from the Biden campaign, we have seen the vice president candidate already being chosen, but um, we haven't seen much of clear policy in this regard. Well, understanding that international relations is not the top priority for an election, but still, this is uh, very interesting. It's not going to be a blaming China fest, is it? The problem that uh, politicians face, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, is that um, over the past three and a half years, this uh, conflict, this trade war, uh, has taken a dramatic toll on uh, public opinion sentiment toward China. In the latest poll conducted by the Pew Research uh, Organization in Washington, um, I think it showed that a, a record 77% of 
of the American public now has an unfavorable view toward China. And the profile of the sentiment cuts across party lines. It's Republicans, Democrats, college educated, um, uneducated, um, uh, male, female, uh, rich and poor. So no politician is going to want to inflame uh, public opinion uh, uh, prior to the, uh, uh, the upcoming uh, November the 3rd election when that public opinion is so strongly uh, persuaded by uh, the negative view of China. Mm -hmm. What I'm hopeful uh, is that um, uh, if there is a, a change in administrations that there will be a different team of uh, experts brought in to assess what is admittedly a complex problem. Uh, no one's going to sweep all the problems uh, away with one fell uh, stroke, uh, but the, the, there will, we will go back to a framework that I think is um, uh, potentially more constructive in resolving areas of mutual collaboration. Mm. My favorite one, which is um, uh, uh, an approach that was followed by both the um, second Bush administration and the Obama administration, was to negotiate on a bilateral investment treaty mm. to open up uh, markets in both countries to each other. And we came very close under President Obama. Of course, under President Trump, those negotiations have been abandoned. But that's an example of finding mutually collaborative areas that benefit both and require compromise right. to reach a framework of agreement. However, if you look at the reality, Mr. Rocha, is this still possible? with uh, the, the ever-deteriorating situation of the bilateral relations, unfortunately. Uh, will there still be atmosphere, ambience, uh, good enough uh, for have uh, negotiations and even to talk about a treaty? Uh, it seems that we are being pushed uh, to a corner uh, at this point. Uh, it, it certainly feels that way right now. I mean, the escalation of, um, of actions that the United States has taken against China uh, in just the last few weeks is without precedent in my uh, memory. But again, I would urge you not to extrapolate. This is uh, a, a pure uh, political reaction to President Trump's very low and declining standings in the polls. Mm. And if what I said to you is correct uh, in terms of how this uh, fits with the Republican strategy document that has actually been leaked out uh, in, in, in the media, this is exactly what uh, the strategists uh, uh, would suggest, and that is the worse the president's standing becomes uh, due to the malfeasance of his policies in dealing with the coronavirus, right. the more he is going to attack China. Mm -hmm. So don't extrapolate, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, if there is a, a political shift, uh, there would be an opportunity to reset the relationship on a more constructive um, uh, uh, ground. As the slogan goes, keep calm and move on, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> what they say. It's a good one, huh? for now at least. Uh, the U.S. problem, once it cannot solve its own problem, it cannot export those problems to the others either, and others could not solve their problems uh, for the United States. So uh, many here in China feel very helpless about the U.S. is trying to export its own challenges to the shoulders of China, uh, which is a foreign country and which is a, war, a different people. So uh, are we going to see practices like this by the U.S. side continuously, even with a new administration? As you said, the atmosphere might be different. We're going through a racial uh, reawakening of a long simmering problem that uh, has been evident in the United States uh, really uh, for most of its history. Uh, and, um, you know, the very public murder of uh, George Floyd mm -hmm. has ignited a, um, uh, a sentiment and a, and a, and a view uh, not seen in the United States, certainly. Uh, in my lifetime, and I'm old enough to have lived through the 60s and many of the protests that have okay. followed uh, uh, since then. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that um, there's any 
inclination to blame these problems on, on other countries. My point is, though, as these problems uh, intensify in terms of this national consciousness raising that it's caused, that makes it very difficult for an incumbent president to stand for election. So he creates uh, a distraction by uh, these very aggressive actions uh, aimed at uh, China. He recently, um, very minor, but just indicative of how desperate he is, he once again uh, put uh, tariffs on uh, uh, some products uh, coming in from Canada, mm. citing national security concerns. There's no national security threat uh, from Canada. Everybody knows that. But this, these are the very visible manifestations of a desperate incumbent president. Mm. Uh, it's unfortunate that when politicians are faced with domestic problems, they then want to blame others uh, for creating the conditions under which those problems occur. And China is um, very much a, uh, uh, a target mm. of this uh, political blame game in the United States. And I would urge the Chinese to uh, simply not ignore, but nevertheless understand uh, the extreme political conditions right. that have given rise to this unfortunate turn of events. Thank you so much. Stephen Rocha, senior fellow with the Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs. Be well, sir. You're watching World Insights coming up on our program as part of a series celebrating the 75th anniversary of the victory in the War of Resistance against Japan. A walk down the memory lane with a Chinese American woman keeping alive her grandfather's heroic deeds in defending China from invaders. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. August the 15th marks the 75th anniversary of the Chinese victory over Japanese aggression and invasion during the Second World War. We focus on our younger generation who carry the torch of history and peace and the fighting spirit of their forefathers. Today, we are bringing you a personal account from a young Chinese woman about her family's struggles during World War II. Beijing local Anne Feng, who grew up in both China and the United States, had a deep interest in her family history, especially the stories of her grandpa, Feng Zhongyun, a young intellectual who decided, while studying in university at that time during World War II, to devote his life to pushing back the invading Japanese army. For years, Grandpa Feng fought guerrilla wars in the sprawling cold forests of northeastern part of China. Those were among the bloodiest battles of the Japanese aggression toward China. I spoke to Anna in Beijing at her home. She recounted her grandpa's experience, including the extreme cold weather he and other guerrilla fighters had to endure decades ago. Um, the most difficult time was they had a lot of support from villagers um, that were secretly helping them, but then the Japanese kind of combined all the villagers together to supervise them, so they even lost that support. And Manchuria is very, very cold. It would drop down to minus 30, minus 40, and have blizzards um, very commonly in the winter. And they were th there was a point when he, when times that he, they had to eat their own belts, they had to eat leaves to survive, and, and um, clothing was never enough. What was it like for him to see so many of his colleagues just gone, just like that? I, of course, I can't really um, think back about war as something so different. Just coming from one of the stories that um, my mother told me. So I was in Harbin at a um, at a funeral, my mother said, you had to go, and I was like, I don't know this person, why are we going? Um, so I went to the funeral, and my mother said that this person um, once saved your grandfather's life. And I was like, 
I was like, oh, so what, what was the story? And my mother said, um, they, in the woods, they were having my grandfather there. They were fighting in the forests. Yes, and they had like this secret meeting in a, in a little house. But then the Japanese came, so they were attacked on their surprise. So everyone was killed. Most of the people were killed. And my grandfather was just completely shocked because he, he luckily survived this kind of attack. And he was he was just kind of not very, he wanted to bury his friends on site, he couldn't leave them there. And he was in emotional stress and couldn't really deal with the situation. And then this person that I went to the funeral with, he dragged my grandfather away. He said, the Japanese are coming again, you have to leave. Mm -hmm. And they did come back. So it was really, um, this person that rescued him. Mm -hmm. So that's why even today, like, I remember going to this person's funeral um, in Harbin. Mm. There are many well-known stories for the guerrilla warfare mm -hmm. in northeast part of China or Manchuria. For example, Yang Jingyu story. Yes, yeah. Tell us about that story because many of our international viewers might not necessarily know, first of all. And secondly, how did your grandparents recount stories like these about their comrades. So the story of Yang Jingyu for me comes into different layers. Of course there's the official one that all, all children learn in textbooks. He's the, the, the war hero that everyone admires. And then there's the personal second layer of how this person is related personally to my own family, to my grandfather. He was a comrade of my grandfather because they were both in charge of different sectors of the guerrilla armies in Manchuria at the same time. And then to my grandmother, because uh, my grandmother worked as a very young kind of uh, messenger. She, she worked undercover, undercover, so she was um, delivering secret notes to people um, and carrying out work there. So once she, she actually was liaisoning with Yang Jimmy personally and delivered a note to him once. It's one thing to know a hero passed away. It's a totally different thing to know someone that you know personally just gone. Of course, Yang Jingyu, we all, the, the, the famous story goes that he, he was tracked down by the Japanese. He was the last man standing in very, very difficult circumstances. Um, at last, he was um, killed by the Japanese, but the Japanese, was, well, they couldn't understand how this person could continue to fight by himself without any food or supply. It was just like humans cannot, can, cannot do this. So what they did is that they, they cut open his body to figure out what was, he, what was he surviving on. And of course, they found twigs and cotton and, and tree leaves. And that was what he was eating for the last few days of his life. And um, his head was later on cut off as a trophy um, by the Japanese. Um, and this connects back to my grandmother. She, so when the Japanese um, left, they, they, were, they returned the heads, with they cut off um, many heads of these people, so they returned them to the Chinese authorities. Um, and my grandmother was in charge of this process. Mm. That was when the Japanese already lost the war? Yes, this was after the war. Um, and it was a very emotional process for her, I think. Um, when, so they, they set up a so small memorial before they received the proper burial. But the younger people working with my grandma at the institution was quite scared of the presence of, of having heads in, in the room. But my grandmother was probably the only one brave enough to kind of take care of the setting. So she would go there inside by herself and look at, I think there were portraits and she was looking at the faces of these people that she once knew. Um, I, I can't really understand. And she cleaned the glasses. Yes. Yes. So, and, and then she, she was looking at the portraits and she was dusting the, the boxes with the heads. So it's, it's a, I mean, she doesn't talk about it in such a dramatic way. It's just like a small anecdote that you hear growing up. Um, and then you realize how powerful and emotional it is. War claims people's lives and separates families and friends. Feng Zhongyuan and his wife Shui Wen 
got engaged in their hometown in 1931 and just three years later they were forced to be separated. In 1934, Fung decided to join the guerrillas in fighting against Japanese aggression, while Chui headed back to her hometown, Jiangsu, along with her two kids. It wasn't until 12 years later that they saw each other again after the Japanese surrendered at the end of World War II. I mean, now you look at, there's so many TV shows about secret agents at that time and everyone's watching it thinking it's the, the most amazing thing ever, it's really cool. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, my grandparents were like that actually. But you don't, I think they, they were doing this not because it was cool, it was um, it was very extremely dangerous and um, the mem members of that group were some were in prison, some were captured, some disappeared. It wasn't, a, it wasn't something fashionable to do at that time. It was, and you never know if the outcome is going to be promising. So it, I think it, it was a very courageous thing to do at that, at that time. Your grandparents were separated for a long period of time during the war. But have your grandma ever talked about her desperation? What was it like for her to go through all of these years on a personal basis? She had this secret song that she sang. Really? There, there was two songs, I think. Um, it was a funny story because they didn't know about this until years later other people told, told each other. So when my grandma um, was alone to deal with the situation. She she would sing a song by herself, by the riverside, um, um, and the lyrics were kind of reflecting on her situation. Like what? Um, that she became this lonesome um, bird, um, kind of disconnected from her flock, that she was alone. And then in the lyrics there's also this kind of um, rumination on, okay, um, your child, so, so she, she had my um, eldest aunt, and my eldest aunt grew up very fast. And I think my aunt's presence was very important for her because it's a remembrance of those days in Manchuria. Mm. And she sent my eldest aunt to, the, um, to join the army. Um, so she said, oh, maybe if she joins the army, she would be able, through the army system, um, she, her, my aunt can find my grandfather. It's all about your grandpa. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And my grandpa was also singing a song secretly. Oh, yeah? When he was at the 88th Brigade, um, he would, like, sneak into the woods and sing a song to himself. And all the Korean ladies at the would, would know the song and they would sing it, too. So years, years later, um, my grandmas met with these ladies and they sang the song, which is a Chinese song from Shanghai. And my grandma's like, how, how did you learn this song? And they're like, oh, yeah, your husband used to sing it all the time when she, she was, um, he was thinking about you. Your grandma must be very touched by then. Yeah, I think so. Fung and Shui reunited after 12 years, but many of Fung's comrades never got the chance to meet their loved ones again. Fung promised that he would take care of the children they left behind. The couple helped settle children in schools and, despite surviving on limited means, also took a group of Chinese kids who returned from the former Soviet Union under their wings. Yeah, I remember it was in the 90s when I was about, I think, eight or nine years old. And there was this day that I think almost like 30 of these old grandpas and grandmas came in. They all spoke in heavy Russian accents. They were Chinese, actually. And then they just pushed our sofa aside, our tables aside, <laughs> right here in this room, put on loud Russian music and started dancing all night and singing and drinking vodka. And, <laughs> and um, That was a crazy party, isn't it? It was a crazy party, and my grandma was very delighted. Um, she was so happy that day. Um, and then I asked my mom, like, who, who are these people? And they said, oh, they're all orphans. They were, they were orphans during the war, or they were separated from their parents. Um, they were left in Russia when they came back to China. My grandmother and grandfather... Who were their parents? They were um, children of parents who were fighting in the war, but couldn't take care of these children, and they were um, left in the Soviet Union. Um, some of them are very famous um, people. Um, Old Chinese revolutionaries. Yes, yes. Um, and they came back every year to see my grandma. Um, 
I think the relationships didn't start when they came back. Um, my grandmother and grandfather after the war started this uh, school for war orphans in Harbin. Um, but these children, they, they were completely Russianized. They only spoke Russian. They ate potatoes, bread, butter. <laughs> They just couldn't eat with, couldn't deal with the lifestyle at a Chinese orphanage. So my grandparents made a very important decision, that is to take them all home. So did you manage to uh, talk to some of these old grandmas and grandpas? Well, maybe they were having the vodka. <laughs> or to your grandparents about what war, that war, Second World War, really meant to them? I, well, first of all, they, they would come in and give me a Russian name. They called me Anya. <laughs> um, I think for, for, for those people, the, the, the children that came back from Russia, it is, it is a strange kind of memory because they were still very, very young. I think coming back to China really was a new life for them. So they didn't talk that much about that period. Of course, they were very young. And my grandmother, she, there will all, always be these family anecdotes that runs um, during dinner at the dinner table. And when you're young, you don't, you're kind of like, oh, there's grandma talking that story again. <laughs> but then when you, when you grow up and really think about it, there are very like emotional, sometimes traumatic and sometimes very courageous events. Like once my grandma said that um, during the sack of Nanjing and her family was on this little boat outside the city and they were kind of, um, kind of running away from it and trying to like secretly at night take this boat in the river. And then there was, her whole family was on the boat. And then the, the Japanese soldiers were on the banks and can hear them. And also there were dead bodies in the river and they kept on pushing up the boat so you can hear them. So you can feel that kind of fear. fear. And then there was this little girl on the boat that wanted to drink water. And then her grandpa was reaching for that little bottle of water, but it spilled. So to save the whole, the whole boat, because this child was crying, he took water from the river that had dead bodies in it to give it to her. So it's just like, my grandma tells the story all the time, and when I was little, I was just like, here we go again. But when you grow up and think about it, it's, it's so real, that moment, how to, like, how to survive and to save the family and all the choices you have to make. We are so far away from war, but when you look at history, it's actually not that far away. What is it like for you to be raised in a family like this, in which everyone has their wartime stories? First of all, I grew up with all these pictures um, in my living room, all these photographs, mm -hmm. and grandma telling me about things on the dinner table. Um, it's, you don't really make sense of it once you're a child, child, you're still home. But it's really when you're leaving, going outside, going to America, and speaking about this history with other people that went through probably the same thing, whether it's in England or America. I mean, there's still veterans out there and, and relatives of veterans, and they're fascinated by this history that, that we share together. And your boyfriend, also coming from a Jewish family, they have very similar stories as well. My fiancé, is um, his family is British, um, but um, his, his grandfather, his mother's side, were German-Jewish. And in the late 30s, their family escaped um, Nazi Germany and resettled in England. And, um, and then they later on fought um, against the Germans. Mm. So, and then I told them about their family, about my, my family's history, and they were so fascinated about it. And they wanted to read my grandma's memoir. Common memories bound people together. Yeah, of course. A family story during World War II, China's fight against Japanese aggression. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye.